Bob, you've been out of the public spotlight for several years. What are you doing nowadays? What keeps Bob Nay going nowadays? I've been halfway in, one foot in, one foot out. I took a job eventually with uh, Ellen Ratner, Talk Radio News Service, which I didn't originally want to do, frankly, because when she first proposed it, I said, wait a minute, I don't want to back in any form of, uh, of a spotlight or a public venue. And she said, I think you'd be good at analyzing news. So then I went ahead and did that. And then she and Howard Monroe approached me about WBLY. And I did the talk radio show for a year. I, I liked it. I really liked it quite a lot and working with Howard. But the thought of continuing, and I'm locked to five days a week, uh, those hours, just you know, wasn't the most enthusiastic uh, venture for me. But I really liked it working with him and doing that. So now I do two things. I continue political uh, analyst work for talk radio news service, calling stations across the country, stations to the left, the right, and in between. It's kind of interesting. And uh, the second thing I do is uh, I'm the executive director of a brand new foundation, which is actually incorporating it now, called Mending Minds. And it utilizes the uh, meditation, particular Tibetan meditation, not as a religion, but as a, a I think a proven scientific fact that meditation can help people with PTSD, our veterans who are returning with terrible stress, uh, PTSD stress and substance abuse using meditation, kind of in lieu of medication. Mm -hmm. And so we're just creating that right now and it's brand new. It's going to be up and running pretty soon. And Alan Ratner, it was her idea, who is my boss at Talk Radio News. Okay. And I babysit. Grand. Granddaughter. And then I'm going to take a wild guess. You just as soon be doing that full time. Mm -hmm. Not a bad job. Yes, yes. It's been about five years since your political career came to an end because of the Jack Abramoff scandal. You're obviously a much different person nowadays. Uh, quite frankly, uh, for a long time when uh, you were in Congress, you were someone who looked like he probably needed a little bit of meditation to calm down a bit. I would assume. What are your thoughts about who you were then, five, ten years ago, and who you are now? Well, events happen in your life. As my grandmother always said, you know, one door closes and the other opens. It's just that the door that closes sometimes kicks you in the rear end quite hard before another one opens. So things happen within your life. I like to think, though, that some of the, I don't know, I'll call it energy or maybe some anger or attitude was helpful in Washington to take on some people. Uh, probably you go overboard, you get caught up in things you, for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, substance abuse, alcohol, whatever the issue is, working a lot of hours, not focusing on the moment, then you start to lose your way. But I would hope that there was some qualities that I had at that point in time that still uh, remain today. But obviously you don't go through something like I did and uh, not have some change. Now, you can change in several ways. Webb Hubble, who was uh, in prison, my best friend of Bill Clinton, he was in a Rose Law firm. Before I went to prison, or as I like to call it, the Bush Housing Program, I talked with Webb, Webb Hubble for five hours face to face. And Webb told me something I'll never forget. He said, look, there were three of us that went in prison, three or four people he knew. He said, uh, three of us came out, you know, with some scars and bumps and bruises and uh, but were in a condition to be able to pick up our lives. And he said, one went mentally ill forever. And I remembered what he said. So you have to, you know, be careful because just when you have these epiphanies or you have these life-altering changes doesn't mean that's going to make you a better person it can you can lose your way so you have to maneuver through that and decide where you want to be so I think part of it probably yeah I'm a calmer person I would also uh, think that uh, sometimes not being so calm in Washington wasn't too bad but obviously went overboard well there's change people change is there and, and you were in Congress a driven, get things done kind of guy who I'm guessing the opposition didn't like very much, probably more than some of their other opponents. Is there, in that regard, is there anyone like you in the House now? 
I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't unique, but there, there were people in several categories. And first of all, a lot of good members I served with. I, I saw some of the really most enlightened, great moments, both publicly and privately, that a human being could see. And I also saw some of the most disgusting, uh, clueless, weak need moments that a human being would want to regurgitate at. I saw both, and so I wasn't unique. But there were fighters out there, fighters that were of, of opposite political uh, parties of me and opposite philosophies, but you had to respect them for fighting for the issues. But there are some people I think, Steve LaTourette of Ohio is a great congressman who gets a lot of crap thrown at him. I know the leaders see him and say, oh, please, but he speaks, I think, his mind. Two other people, and my friends all from the right and left both get mad at me for these two names, Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> and I know everybody's saying that. Okay, you did, you lost your mind in prison. But Ron Paul tells you where he's at, where he's going to be, and he remains there. Dennis Kucinich the same way. Whether you like Dennis or you don't, or you think, wow, you know, he's on Mars, or he's trying to get a new congressional district, he, he will come out and, and say what his belief is, and you know where he's at. So there are people that you can respect as fighters, even if they don't agree with you. And they're out there, and there's also backbenchers that think that they can vote, I voted this way. They don't have to participate back home. They don't have to work with local economic development people. This is a multi-phase job. It's not just here's how I voted now. You know, you won't know who I am. You'll see me maybe in two years. So, it's it's a multi-dimensional. There's people out there that are, are fighters. Good. Looking back, what do you think your biggest accomplishment was when you were in Congress? My legacy bill. I'd answer it two ways. One, my legacy bill, as we all call it, everybody has to have a legacy bill, and uh, that was the Help America Vote Act. Mm -hmm. I can remember at one point in time, Dick Garvey came to me, he wanted me to vote for this education bill that was absolutely uh, terrible. And this congressman was retiring. So he came to me and he said, you know, you've got to vote for that bill. I said, that destroys education as we know it. He said, but it's his legacy bill. I said, oh, so I vote for his legacy bill and destroy education because it's his legacy bill. So that's a word you hear all around Congress. Help America Vote Act was my legacy bill. It redefined the election systems nationally for the first time in the history of the country. It uh, had federal uh, process changes for elections, but it didn't control it. We made a commission, or I wouldn't have passed the bill, that specifically said you cannot make a rule as a Federal Election Commission body on election law. I'm not going to tell you what time to turn lights off and on or what time you're going to, in fact, open the polls or close them. Now, ironically, it was that bill, the Help America Vote Act, that caused the controversy with Jack Abramoff and the uh, amendment he wanted affecting the Indian tribes, mm -hmm. which never went in the bill, but that was my legacy bill. So if you ask me what's the, the legislative piece that was the most proud legacy, is the HAVA Act. But the other thing I think my greatest achievement, I, I believe, uh, and there's you know, plenty of things I didn't achieve, but was working on the economic side of it. That's kind of multi-phased. Voting to, you know, for the first balanced budget in generations back in 1998, trying to restrain some of the growth of the government, but also working with development people back here. Because you've got to restrain the rules and regulations of an out of control government. You've got to restrain the spending habits. Uh, you know these now they're like uh, unsatisfiable nymphomaniacs in Washington, and they have been for quite a while. But you also have to be active. This is not a, a, a sit back and observe. I think position for a congressman, and so I think my best achievement was to work with the development people and these development entities, try to bring jobs try to save some, try to create some. I think that in the district was my probably best achievement. Well, speaking of that, uh, back I think it was 2005, you managed to get uh, 1.7 million dollars in federal funding to remove the Belair Bridge. Yeah, that's gone, isn't it? By, uh, <laughs> by bits and pieces. Um, as I recall, the money was later pulled back. Um, how, how do you view that? Should we have gone ahead and used the public money to remove the bridge because it is still there and uh, the folks under it 
do say yes, it's coming down piece by piece. Should we have gone away ahead with that, or should the private sector have been held responsible for removing it? The bridge, and I don't know the stats of the bridge. I only know what I read, which it was going to be in this uh, TV thing that blew it up or something. And so far, I guess that's not happening. As, uh, after a fairly long court fight, as I understand it, there is a company that does plan to bring it down mm -hmm. for salvage mm -hmm. now. Uh, I'm not sure what the timeline is. The bridge was, and, and this story I realized evoked a lot of emotion, and it did out of me and, and made. Uh, uh, battles with, frankly, me and the media and things, uh, and then the whole issue of Barrett, the owner, and we had our office over there, things like that. But th this is how I looked at the bridge. Several points. Number one, whoever, in fact, cut that deal for the state of Ohio should have absolutely been investigated. No question about it. At the time, Jack Sarah was the state rep. I was the state senator. All of a sudden, Jack and I read in the newspaper, and I, and I can recall this conversation, and I'm sure Jack would, would verify this. We read where there had been an emergency measure, uh, so that was the governor, to buy this bridge and rip it down. Well, Jack and I were upset about that because I was on the controlling board. All appropriations have to come to it. I called Carol Pierce Mix, I can remember her name. I said, why did you not bring that to the controlling board? She said, well, Frankly, it may not have gotten approved. I said, why not? She said, well, because you call me, aren't you? You and Jack Sarah want this not to happen right now. You want to see if you can build a ramp. Well, of course Jack and I did. That's what we wanted immediately. I was, I was like, well, don't rip it down. Let's see if we can do something first. Then if you have to rip it down, you do. She said, well, we just went emergency. I don't know who did what or when, uh, especially after what happened with me. I don't like to speculate. Because I, I really don't know. But I do know this. Whoever cut that deal with ODOT said to those investors on that interstate bridge company, and I had no idea who they were or are. I've never found anybody that knows who they are or were. There was investors. And they, they should have said, here's the money, minus this, the bridge gets ripped down as soon as you sign the paper. That never happened. They said, here's the money. So then there was some transfer of money to the uh, Barrett Corporation. I clearly, and, and interacted with Roger Barrick at the request of so many people, and we were very public about this, please Roger, don't rip that bridge down, don't do that, we want to save it. There was an active movement here of businesses to save yes. that bridge, emergency squads. I remember. After a certain period of time, it went on so long that uh, there was no ramp that was going to be built. There was, and we had walked ODOT actually down here, I think me, and I can't remember who had been state rep at the time, but we, we walked him down here. And uh, maybe Jack Sarah was still in. And we were going to try to still do something. So at the end of the day, there's a lawsuit that comes upon, I don't know which arm of the government brought a lawsuit with Roger Barrick. And my idea was no matter, you know, if, if this lawsuit came about and Roger Barrick, you know, lost the lawsuit, okay, that money has to go back to the U.S. government to strip the thing down finally and be done with it. But it turned into a huge controversy, mm -hmm. so I just stopped appropriation. Do you think that uh, it should have gone ahead then? Just oh, yeah. gotten the thing then? Got it down if, and I don't even know what happened with Barrick's lawsuit with the feds. I had no idea. But, irregardless of whether he was being sued or not, I didn't feel that was, was our deal. We rip it down. If he loses the lawsuit, the feds get that money. There's no question. Whatever amount of money it was, the Fed's good. But it got all intertwined and you know, a lot of controversy. I understand. Yeah. And then it hurt me out there because people finally said, what are, you just, what are you doing? And my staff drove me crazy. Why even do this? Just screw it. My staff said that. I said, well, because it's the right thing to do. His lawsuit is his lawsuit. Roger Barrick loses. He wins. So what? The bridge is down. It's gone. Because the price kept escalating on the thing. Speaking of your staff, uh, and I'm not focusing on your staff, but it seems to me that an awful lot of people get elected to Congress, uh, and one of their top priorities always is helping their local area, as it should be. They get to Washington, and the next thing they know, they are surrounded by staff members who 
some of whom probably couldn't find the district on a map without some oh, yeah. coaching. Absolutely, 100% right. Is that a challenge in terms of, an, and again, I'm speaking generically, not just with your staff, but in terms of keeping the focus on your district when you've got a bunch of staff members who may say, no, we've got to talk about defense spending and we've got to focus on uh, jobs, bills, etc. Is that a challenge for a member of Congress to, uh, to get the resources devoted to his district? It's huge and, and it, it's critical. You, you've actually embarked on a discussion here that is so rarely ever talked about. We talk about the stepchildren in Congress. We have a re reference privately to it. We call them the stepchildren. That's the district. The district are the stepchildren. That's how you hear it referred, our stepchildren. The district should be the father. DC's the stepchild, is the way it should be. We had in our office, and I was very proud of this, we had a mandatory, mandatory, unless you know you had some medical illness, you had to the district had to come to DC, basically one or two at a time. They could opt to stay with a staff member or we would put them up in a hotel and they had to work for a week in Washington. All the Washington people had to come back here. So all of a sudden, somebody here in the in the Blair or St. Clairsville office when we had it, we'd go out to DC, because they would interact with on the phone with our people in Washington. And they would say, Well, you know, why can't you do this or that? And all of a sudden that person got to DC, people come through the door, there's farm farm bureau, school kids. Reporters, you name them, are coming in that office in Washington, and the person from from Belmont County that works for us is sitting there saying, "Wow, no wonder they it's tough for them to call me back." And then all of a sudden, the person from D.C. comes in here, and they see all of the constituent casework that's being done, the constituents that's very pointed personal casework that they need, important casework. So they live in each other's shoes. When I became chairman of House Administration, I picked up more staff and chairman of the Housing Subcommittee, I picked up more staff. They eventually had 68 people divided, 22 for the district to service the 18th, and the, uh, the rest uh, of the people, 40-some, were House Administration and Housing. So I proposed another idea, which our staff really hated. I was the thread. There was the Housing Staff, House Administration, and District Office, which had nothing to do with each other. But I had to deal with all those people. So we actually had a retreat where all the staff, House Administration, Housing, and the federal personal staff for the district came together. We worked very hard. And when I say we, our staff people, you know, Volz was you know, Chief of Staff, Dave DeStefano before that, our district directors with Mike Carey at one time, and then um, Matt Parker, uh, Dan Lipperman. We worked very, very hard because there's always a stepchild attitude, and all of a sudden the staff are rubbing each other the wrong way, and constituents just hurt out of it. If they did that, it would be much better. And I think a lot of members don't do it. They simply don't do it. Now, are you going to take a little bit of heat about using government money to uh, transport people back and forth? Sure. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. You can look through that. I, I rambled on a long time about that, but you, you're touching on something that people will never talk about. Personal things in those offices create problems for constituents or benefits. And that's one where they lose total touch. They're out there with the D.C. staff that says, you know, uh, we've got the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and we've, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And then all of a sudden, the district takes a little bit of back seat. The staff feels like stepchildren, and it's not good. Mm -hmm. We're uh, getting close to the 10-year 10, 10 anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. You have pretty interesting personal story about the events that day. Tell us what happened to you. Sort of the reason I'm working for Talk Radio News right now is Ellen Ratner, who uh, owns it, uh, tells me that Moon's made of green cheese, I might believe her. But uh, Ellen had a birthday coming up and there were two dates given to us. And it ended up, one of the dates would have been a voting day anyway, but we, we may have you know missed some of the, of the evening votes. To go to it, but what ended up happening was Ellen's birthday was August 28th, but she moved it into September. I never liked to spend a weekend in Washington if I didn't have to. With the kids back here, and I lived in the district, I didn't live in D.C. So we went to a meeting when I got back into Washington. Jenny, my scheduler, came over and said that we're going to have an event in uh, New York. You'll open NASDAQ, it was at 7.30 in the morning, NASDAQ opens. 
you go up into the towers, you go up into the restaurant, you're going to have a little reception with somebody, can't remember who. You'll stay about 10, 10 o'clock or so, you'll come down. Eventually you do a fundraiser in New York, of course you're going to do fundraiser for noon. And bang the gavel and close the New York Stock Exchange that night, that was the plan. And she told me about it and I said, when is it? She said, well, we had two dates, September uh, 11th or seven days before September the 4th. And I said, oh, you know, I guess that would make me having to spend two weekends in Washington because Ellen moved her birthday party into September and I couldn't get back home in time. She said, well, you know, I just talked to them. I think they gave us two dates. We could probably move it. And she went out and came back and said, yeah, we, we moved it a week earlier. So on, uh, it was, I think, a Tuesday, whatever that day was. I was opening NASDAQ. Staff and I went up the top of the, of the tower, looked out over New York, um, had the you know, small event there, some bagels, whatever we had, came down, did the fundraiser, and closed the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so I'd have been looking at that plane, obviously, coming in that morning. Then, of course, I ended up the second place in the Capitol. The only place I wasn't was the, you know, was the Pentagon. Uh, it was a hot spot. It was just, it was a weird thing that happens in your life where, you know, you definitely could have been there. Did you uh, ever go back and say exactly what floor would I have been on, which tower? Oh, we knew. We were in the top where the restaurant was. So you... Uh, we were the very would have best been in the top. Yeah. Pretty big trouble had yeah. you done it on September 11th. a week earlier, I remember we looked out over the very top they took us up there. Yeah, it's really been not so nice a place to be. Um, did you just put that down to coincidence, or was there any divine intervention there? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, karma, God, higher power, whatever you want to put it. I, I think we take twists and turns. You just never know. If I had never met Ellen, if I had, you know, of course I can put that in other terms. If I had never met Jack Abramoff. <laughs> you, know, right. you never know. Right. So life has its twists and turns, and I, I think you can make decisions that makes it turn one way, or some things happen. You know, that day, of all things, my scheduler could have literally said, well, this is the date, and walked out. Or I could have said, wow, that really displeases me that I would have to spend two weekends in Washington and not said anything. I just said, wow. That's just, you know, that day, she said, I think we can change it. So, you never know, yeah. for the good or the bad. How well do you think we've handled the uh, war on terror, if you want to call it that? Well, we probably made an error in proclaiming a war on terror. You know, World War II, we had the war on the Nazis. And we were at war with the Japanese and the Italians, sided with you know, the Allies. We made a war on terror. I'm not so sure on a psychological basis you can win a war on terror. You know, Osama bin Laden attacked us with the Taliban from Afghanistan. You had Saddam Hussein in, um, you know, uh, over in Iraq. You now have Muammar Gaddafi, and that's a whole different story. First we hate him, then we like him, then we open an embassy, now we tell him to go. Yeah, let's make our minds up. But. The war on terror was a very broad, and I think it came for a reason, it was a very broad base. And I remember, not to disparage good Congressman Ralph Fregula, who's, who's still alive, but I remember I objected terribly to government purchasing this Wayne National Forest. It looked like they took a shotgun and they'd buy an acre in Monroe County, an acre in Belmont, they owned 78% of Lawrence County, it was just ridiculous. So the bills were coming up, and I said, Ralph, I, you've got $200 million. He was one of the cardinals. They call themselves cardinals. He's a nice man, but they were cardinals. And you said, hi, cardinal, to him. Oh, yeah. I love these open secrets now that I'm out of cover. <laughs> yeah, you call them cardinal, because the 13 cardinals that were under the appropriations chairman, and they were like the pope and the... And they were very powerful, believe me. Because uh, I may not have told the story while Ralph was still in office as a cardinal. So he had this appropriation, two or three hundred million. I said, we're hurting on money, we spent all this money, uh, we don't need to do that. And uh, Ralph said, and this was, because Bush was starting to really spend money. And Ralph said, this is part of the war on terror. Okay, so if they attack Wayne National Forest, we'll be able to defend it. But that, that quote, uh, and not to pick on Ralph, but that we used everywhere. This is the war on terror, part of the war on terror. So, uh, how have we done on the war on terror look? Uh, this can't be anymore about winning or losing. 
if it's about winning, we could be there 30 more years. You win or you lose, you did your best effort, we did as, as a country. Afghanistan was very pointed, and the Taliban was there, and we needed to go in and root it out. Saddam Hussein, because if you ask me what I am most sorry for, the escapades with Abramoff and my mistakes and the illegal things I did is not number one. Believe it or not. Okay. It's number two. What well, is number one? Well, number one, and I didn't do it intentionally, number one is the fact that we didn't dig deep enough to see if there were lies. I lied, no one died. Bush, his people lied and people died. There were no weapons of mass destruction. If we want to go in and get a lunatic, Start with Sudan. As far as I'm concerned, the premier of China is a lunatic. Uh, puts people in prison, uh, forces abortions, slave labor uh, after our job. So I can pick you a lot of lunatics. President of Iran, Ahmadinejad, wow, let's put him on the top of the list. But we got Saddam Hussein because I sat in that room and we were in a classified situation and we were told this, this, and this, and shown pictures, and we're all like, oh. So I voted to give full force and authority to President Bush. Colin Powell, who I respect so much, in his heart, and, and everybody that knows Colin Powell knows this, his heart sunk. He went and lied at the United Nations. Intentionally, absolutely not. He was fed the same garbage we were fed. So having said that, that was the war on terror. And when you get a blanket war on terror, you get the Saddam Hussein's of the world, who was no good. And the Iraqi people, I think, are better off. But at the end of the day, what are we doing now in Iraq? We announced the other day, Liam Panetta, that, well, we might be there until 2012. And the Iraqi said, huh? We don't want you. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what are we doing? You know, if I come down here and you say, what are you doing here, Bob? What are you in these offices for? Get out of here. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait, wait a day. No, you're not. No, no, I'll just let me alone. I'll, I'll be here. It's not how life works. And, and, and uh, so, you know, We've got to cut our losses over there. Then economically, the Iraqi infrastructure, because these wars make no bones about it, were military and civil, in the sense of not civil internal, civil projects. And we spent money, and we, we, we spent a lot of money in both countries. All the projects are, are disintegrating in Iraq, and we're going to have to cough up about, I think, if I'm correct, $400 billion mm -hmm. to continue these. Mm -hmm. If we save them, if we did so much for their democracy, let them pay for it. They have oil. Let them pay for it. I mean, I, I'm not saying that Saddam was a good guy, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing he's removed. When you do this blanket, go get a war on terror, let's just go bomb Iran, and let's go bomb you know, Libya, and let's bomb the Sudan. So, as far as if we won the war on terror, we've done a good, decent job, I think. But, uh, look, we have two situations there that have got to come to some form of an end. And it can't be about did we win or lose in our pride. You know, you just don't want a Vietnam. Yeah. There was no exit plan. No. But you bring up a, a good point. Um, the decision to invade Iraq was a bipartisan, wide support. A lot of people on both sides of the political aisle looked at what they thought were the facts mm -hmm. and said, we just don't have a choice. Now, you look back and you say, well, as, as you said, maybe we should have dug deeper. First part of my question is, do you think it would have been possible for you to dig deeper and get the information? And the second part of my question is, do we have the same situation today? Can Congress be misled massively on something like that today? Well, second question, yes. They, they can. They can be misled can happen. The first part of the question, I've run this again over and over in my mind, and I'm sure you would expect me to say my biggest mistake was Abramoff, but my biggest mistake, Jack was the second in what I got into with him, but my biggest mistake was in my mind, because I feel bad about it, was not fully investigating to the best of my ability. And if you'd have sat in that room, you probably would have voted the way I did. If you would have and I still can't, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to respect the system and not say what I saw, but 
If you saw what I saw, you probably, well, you can imagine, we, we drug Democrat votes on this issue. You say, oh, wow, we've got to do something. I went over to, uh, to the Mideast, I went in, into an intelligence section we have over there, and I saw other things. And when I went in that intelligence section, and I started to look around, that was the first time I started to say, wait a minute, something doesn't feel right. You know, I voted for this, and something doesn't feel right. I'm looking at all these things, and I'm wondering, you know, what's not right? And then, of course, we found there was no weapons of mass destruction. Someone lied. Now, can we prevent it in the future? Yes. If we get the people who lied to us, or who had such bad information, it's unbelievable, and we go after them legally, same as, you know, I falsified a document, falsification of a document, that's falsifying information to Congress. Maybe it will teach the intelligence agencies to be straight shooters with us. We have a similar situation going on right now. Hillary Clinton, under Barack Obama, is amazingly coming close, I think, to delisting the terrorist Mojahedin cult group. Clinton listed them as a terrorist twice. Bush listed them twice. Condoleezza Rice on Obama's way in said, okay, I'll do it for you, and she listed them. Hillary Clinton is now on an unholy alliance thinking about and considering whether to list them or delist them. Clinton just said they're terrorists. They took our embassy. They assassinated Americans. The M.E.K. they're called. Now, members of Congress are out publicly supporting them saying, well, they're the enemy of our enemy, Iran. They're, they're the same fascists as the current president of Iran. No, no difference. But when you look at that, it's, it has flashbacks of me of Chalabi, Ahmad Chalabi, it has that flashback to me. He told us things. We believe him. He's sitting down in the Iraqi government. We believe him, lock, stock, and barrel. Because he hated Saddam, and we hated Saddam. Now you've got the MEK. They hate Ahmadinejad in Iran, so we like the MEK. One thug replaces another thug in some of these situations. I told Karl Rove, pers Rove personally to his face when we went to Iraq, you may get the democracy you don't want. You may get it. This is cultural. Don't expect it to be like America. Don't expect them to thank us. The next thing is the Taliban in Afghanistan. We helped them kick the Soviets out, and the next thing we sure. do, we get them hosting people we didn't like. But the bottom line, you got our, our brave men and women over there, and, and look, nobody wants to, to cut off the support to them. But if you have the commander-in-chief bring them back, then you have to worry about cutting the soldiers off. But right now, I don't blame a member. You don't, they don't want to cut the money off because what are you doing to the men and women in uniform? It's, it's, not, it's not fair to them. Right. And I've been to all three war zones, Bosnia, when we were in the conflict, Baghdad and Kabul. So I've, I've seen it on the ground, not just information in Washington. Um, let's get back to domestic politics. Do you have any prediction for who is going to get the Republican nomination for president? And who would you like to see get the Republican nomination? I believe Mitt Romney will have the Republican nomination for President Mitt Romney will. I would have liked to have seen Palante, personally, but I, I believe Mitt Romney will get the nomination. What about the elephant in the room, Sarah Palin? How she, is she going to get into the race? What chance would she stand if she did get into the race? She'd be a more reserved Michelle Bachman uh, substitute. Sarah Palin would make the race fascinating. I have friends that say, you know, anybody can beat Obama. I didn't believe that by any stretch of imagination. If she got into the race, I think what Sarah Payne would do, just as Newt Gingrich could do, let's go haywire for Newt, she could elevate the issues. She could raise the issues out there, force some of the issues. At first, the Republicans were just so kind of numb and polite, and then all of a sudden they got into it, and Pelleni got into it with Bachman, and of course, Pelleni was verbally and visually reacting to her when he talked about her. She was cold as ice, staring straight ahead, mm -hmm. as she should, and Pelleni all of a sudden fizzled <laughs> and went away. That's not an unhealthy thing, necessarily. You throw any issues out there, Ron Paul does it. So I think uh, Sarah Palin would you know, bring, I think, a lot to the table of just stirring this thing up, getting right to the point of where your uh, philosophy is. I don't think she'd win the nomination, but I think she wouldn't do that bad for the party. You know, let's, let's get the arguments going. This is a, a serious election. It, is there a danger that um, particularly very conservative Americans who dislike our current president, 
president enormously. Is there a danger that we're uh, going to see a false sense of confidence there that they think almost anyone could beat Barack Obama? Do you think that's going to be a problem? I think it is. I think there's two issues on along that line because you bring up, you really bring up a fascinating point and some of it I've heard privately over the years. One, uh, and I hear today, anybody can beat Obama. Anybody. Well, that's not true. And two, from the conservative end, under their breath, you know, it doesn't matter if we don't beat him. We don't beat him. He's going to do such a bad job in four years, there'll be no Democrats standing in the House, no Democrats standing in the Senate. We'll take the whole ball of wax four years from now. There's that theory out there. You don't run the candidate you think you can necessarily win with. You want to stay so pure that you you quote put the the bad guy in for four more years in their mind, the conservatives' mind, put the bad guy in and oh well you'll really see what'll happen. That's not necessarily what reality becomes. That's the second theory. You have uh, called yourself a recovering Republican. What does that mean? I, I you know people ask me what are you I'm a registered Republican. When I say recovering Republican, my attitude today and of course I served a district that was Really, uh, multi-political. We always talk about multicultural areas. It was multi-political. It was a quote Democrat stronghold that had uh, very loyal Republicans and independents. Fifty-three percent were independent in the old district that uh, voted any direction they wanted. The Democrats were not liberal because I would kind of get a kick out of a guy would come up to me or a, a lady and she would say, you know. You're, you're just you're just like I me. Mean, you're like you're a Democrat, and you know I want to keep my gun. I want to protect life, and I you know they better quit spending my money out there. But you know you're you're a Democrat like me. These are very conservative Democrats. So you know it's it's uh, you know very very uh, uh, fascinating makeup of the district. But uh, back to your, your point was the you wanted the. You, you're a recovering. Oh yeah, recovering republic. Okay, I got up on the history of the district because it's it's a nostalgic thing. But when I say recovering today, I had it with certain elements within both parties. I just had it personally. So when I say recovering, I don't drink the Kool Aid. I I am a registered Republican, uh, but I don't drink the Kool Aid or the party. I just don't do that, and I hear it all the time about. This has got to be the mantra. I just don't drink the Kool-Aid. You, you don't drink the Kool-Aid. Would you describe yourself as a tea drinker? Yeah. Oh, a tea, a tea drinker. <laughs> uh, I think the Tea Party has been very good for this country. I really do. People, you know, said, "Oh, they're lunatics, etc." They raised an issue out there. Now they were smart. They didn't get into abortion, gun control, gay marriage. They were smart. They didn't get into that. They got into one element. Of, of the financial side of it. So I got to give them a lot of credit. Yesterday a congresswoman, who I've never even heard of her name before, she had kind of unknown, was screaming that, you know, that they're holding the Congress hostage. First of all, 62 members of the House are, quote, Tea Party candidates. Only about 30 are acti actually active in the Tea Party caucus. So this Democrat is standing there saying, they're holding us hostage. Wow, I mean, she's really giving them credit for completely running the Congress. The Tea Party, you know, wouldn't run my office, but I've got to tell you, I'm very respectful of of what they've done. They they took this and they raised this to the level it needed to be raised. To look, town halls are uncomfortable. Members aren't doing them now. It's shame on them. Go face the voters. Take some heat. Believe me, I did it over the years, especially in 2006 with Jack Abramoff. I still went out publicly, and there's a lot of heat to that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, there's just different elements. When I say recovering Republican, though, I wouldn't be wed to the Republican leadership. I wouldn't be wed to them. I never thought I ever was, but there are certain times, you know, you just kind of, eh, you speak up, but you don't speak up like maybe you want to or something. But when I say recovering Republican, the Republican Party was morphing. And the Tea Party, I think, helped the Republicans get back on track. But it was morphing. And in 2008, when I got out of prison, I looked at the Republican Party, and you had, you know, John McCain. Oh, yawn, please. Mm -hmm. 
you know, who would bomb Canada for fun just in case they got out of control down the road. I mean, his whole mantra was George Bush stuff, you know, the war on terror, terror, terror. Um, so I looked at that, and that's when I started that phrase, recovering Republican. Because I looked at the Democrat Party, and then I looked at the Republican Party, and I, I thought, wow, where are we going here? Good elements in both parties, but I just was unhappy. I'm currently unhappy with the Republican leadership, for example, now. Um, they took a debt ceiling issue, a very serious issue. There's 535 members of the House and Senate when you combine them, 535, which is not a lot of people, overseeing the law for over 350 million people. And they said, okay, we'll pass the debt ceiling bill you know, with, quote, cuts. They don't happen to have a trigger. But we're going to create a committee of 12 people that will speak for all 535 people. So to heck with 97% of the Americans that sent their members to Congress. Your members can't, they're not smart enough, your members, this is what John Boehner said, and Harry Reid, and Barack Obama, they all three said this without saying the words I'm going to say. Y'all aren't smart enough, you can't make those tough decisions. We'll take 12 people as a representative body of the House and Senate and the, and the President, and we'll just put them in a room and tell them make a decision by December 23rd. If I was Standards and Poor's right now, Moody, I'd be like, okay, uh, wow, this is really going to be something. That gives me a lot of confidence. They should have had a vote, ugly as it could have been. Let the process work of subcommittees, <coughs> the Appropriation Committee in the House and Senate, probably involves about, I want to just throw a wild guess, 28 or 30 members and all the subcommittee members. It involves the full body. Mm -hmm. Let them make this, they punted this down the road to 12 people. You talk about, they're going to pale, they're going to make Jack Abramoff and me look like pikers with the defense lobbyists and campaign dollars and, and the media is going to be like, okay, what campaign dollars did you get in the last 48 hours? You know what? I don't care if the man or woman at the table got a campaign contribution. I want them to balance the, the budget. That's all it's going to be. They punted that decision. So I, on the biggest issue in, to me of importance to my grandchildren and future generations and currently to these all these unemployed uh, people that want a job. The biggest issue they had, you had, the, you had uh, uh, Harry Reid, John Boehner, and Barack Obama, and what you ended up with was like the 72nd anniversary of Wizard of Oz. No brains, no heart, no guts. It was Oz. <laughs> these three tried to do this private super deal instead of having votes. Eh, you know, you can. I'm not naive, you can do deals in DC, sure you can make stuff up. That blew apart, so they wait till the last minute to have these votes. They should have just been voting all along. Your member of Congress votes on this very important issue. Maybe they'll cast 15 votes, I don't know. What does it matter? They punted it down the road. So that's my rant about dissatisfaction when the Republican Party had the biggest opportunity ever to really nail this one. You know, for over 200 years, we have managed to sometimes stumble and sometimes run, but we've, we've managed to keep it all together here. This is a two-part question. One, has that just been luck or is it just our system? And two, have you ever considered getting back into uh, formal public life yourself? Yeah, on the first one, our forefathers were so, so brilliant. They created three branches of government. They created a very simple but powerful constitution. Uh, they wanted to make sure we weren't under a king. I heard a guy criticize us on radio today. We don't function like the parliament because the prime minister of, of England functions as prime minister head of the titular head of the government, you know, and then you don't have a queen. Okay, so we'll just hire one, one person to run all this. You know, we, we, we function with a system of the three branches of government, a house and a senate. As I always said when I was in the House, the forefathers made the House and then they made the Senate to confuse everything. So they, they, they made checks and balances. It's really a beautiful system that has remained. We are the greatest democracy on, on planet Earth uh, and it's remained that way. So it was a system set up in a very, very good way. Unfortunately, I think today with, frankly, electronics, uh, 
the computers and Facebook, et cetera, and information flow, that's a wonderful thing, but it's also a, a thing that can be distorted very quickly, all too. So members of Congress are very engaged in the electronic world now, and they, and they say, well, you know, how many, how many uh, electronic hits are coming in on an issue? And I think the system's just gotten away from the more simplicity our forefathers designed it. It's become a very complicated system, and a bureaucracy that keeps building upon itself, like out-of-control bureaucracy that nobody has to even feed anymore. So I, I believe that we had a, a very good structure. It's a structure we can still utilize today, but it's just, it's straight a lot. And it's the, the quick hits, you get attacked on Facebook. Maybe members are going to have to go back to just, you know, ignoring what's said on Facebook and just go out to the county fairs and the streets and like you can talk yeah. to people. The second thing is, um, there would be so many decisions before getting back and I would get back in public life. I'm not, you know, going to lie to you, I, it's not a week that passes I don't get an email or something on Facebook, or, especially when people get angry, then they may forgive a little bit, you know, well you weren't that bad. I even had one guy say, I don't really care what you did. Uh, so I've had all kinds of comments, but as far as, as getting back into public life, there have to be several things. One, I would never run to run. I would not run to run. I never did run to run. Uh, when I ran the first time, I felt that our, our state rep just had had a good career, but just wasn't cutting it anymore. So I always ran uh, for a reason. I never ran for Congress. I refused to run quite a lot. And I looked at it and I thought, we have a great opportunity, the first time in generations, to balance this budget. Because that was the singular uh, statement out of Newt Gingrich's mouth that flipped me from no to yes to run. He said, you're going to accept the challenge to balance this nation's budget, or we're, we're done. And so I, I ran for that. I wouldn't run now, wherever the districts are going to be, just to, quote, run, or be the first person to make history, force them to seat me, which they would try not to seat me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't do it just to do it. There'd have to be other, other factors out there. I would have to see the job that the current person does. And so it's not in my plan, it is not in my plans to run at this point in time. You never say never. Yeah, I've learned yeah. that. Yeah, but right now, it's not. I would have to assess a lot of things in family and uh, you know, all the other issues out there, keeping my, my wits and bearings. I would go in a, uh, you asked about change, I would go in a smarter person in the mm -hmm. sense of you know, watching what you do and following the, the straight and narrow on the issues. But there'd be a lot to it. To, it'd be a very fascinating election, I will tell you that. There's no question about that. I mean, I. Wouldn't expect people to you know, apologize to the district uh, the media venues, but that would be up to them of what they would, uh, would decide on. Very good. All right. Thank you, okay. sir.